Get a head start on your next trophy buck. Order stand placement advanced techniques today at Closing the Distance. Hi, I'm Matt Moore and welcome to Closing the Distance. Today's episode is Love the Bubble. We're going to give you information on exactly what that means. I'm going to share with you a really cool hunt that I had here in East Texas. Brother Mark, he's back with us again for more words of encouragement. It's a good one. Closing the Distance is brought to you by Ozonics. Undetectable, undeniable. Hunter Safety System, dedicated to saving hunters' lives. Executioner Broadhead, born to kill. Treason, don't just blend, become. And by Citadel, revolutionary shoot down shape. After the break, host Matt Moore hunts a weird looking buck. Later on, tips on calming down before the shot. We'll be right back. Closing the distance is made possible by Tree Limb Quivers. There's only one Tree Limb Quiver. Sword Sights, sharp solutions in aiming. Elusive Wildlife Technologies, taking the elusive out of wildlife. The Stage Deer Attractant, finally a synthetic scent that works. Matthews Archery. And by the amazing Luminoc. Can your arrow knock do this? Today on Closing the Distance, I'm bow hunting here in East Texas. It's a track of land that's about an hour and a half, two hours south of here where I live. And I've hunted it for the past four or five years. I, I know the ground really well. Some friends of mine own it that, that let me hunt it. And they invited me to come back and they, and they wanted me to set up in this area. It's pine plantation uh, and it's really hard to hide, to hang a stand in a pine tree. On the east side of this field, there was a sweet gum tree that, had, that was grown up behind one of the pines. I figured if I, if I hung my stand right there and got everything set up and if I brushed it in well that I, I could be hid well enough to pull my bow back and I'm solo filming. So it, I had, had to hide myself filming and hunting and everything. And it, it's gonna be a challenge hunting on the edge of a field, but I got everything set up. And a problem that you have when you're hunting on the edge of a field is, is an access. Uh, you have to walk across the field or walk up down the field's edge. And in the South, our humidity levels are so high, everything that you touch, everywhere you walk, a deer is gonna pick up on it. So I had my boots and everything were sprayed down. I'm having the Ozonics backpack, so I wasn't worried about the deer smelling me. I'm worried about me leaving scent on the ground. So I, I got that problem solved. And it was probably a week and a half, two weeks after I'd hung the stand that I was back out there. I was ready for my first hunt. I was gonna be hunting right next to a protein feeder and a corn feeder, and there was a lot of deer activity, a lot of bucks in this area. They were kind of still on that summertime pattern. They were still in, in bachelor groups, even though it was in that second week of October. And I had a picture of a buck that was really, really odd, a really weird looking deer. He had a really neat uh, left side, a lot of points, and his right side, he had, he had damaged it while he was growing in velvet, or what I thought he had and I had just a couple pictures of him and I knew that he was mature and I asked the landowners about him and they said they had dozens of pictures of him. They really didn't know what had happened to him. They couldn't really identify what deer it was from the previous year, but he was the first deer that stepped out on, on my first afternoon's hunt.
He was out there around 30 yards, and I wanted to take a shot. But deer in the south, they're so athletic, I, I, wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna wanna rush it. I knew everything was gonna be fine. I figured eventually he, he, was, gonna, he was gonna work himself around to me. He's working my way. He's, he's, he's really close. It's going to be a skillet shot, 12 or 13 yards. There's no way I'm going to mess this shot up. And I'm getting my camera framed in good. I'm, I'm getting him squared in. And, but he doesn't stop. I want to grunt stop him, but I'm halfway intimidated to grunt stop him because he's so close. The wind's not blowing. He's not smelling me. Everything's fine. I don't want to spook him. I fr I'm afraid if I, did, if I did stop him or grunt stop him that he may spook and run and never come back. And, and then the other part of me was I, I just knew that he was going to stop anyway because there was other deer around, but he never did. He walked straight through my shooting lane. And th that's the tough part about solo hunting or solo filming. If a cameraman would have been with me, it would have probably been a different story. But I guarantee you, it all worked out in the end. Coming up, it's a few weeks later and the buck returns. We'll be right back. Want more from Closing the Distance? Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram. Closing the Distance is brought to you by Ozonix. Undetectable, undeniable. Hunter Safety System, dedicated to saving hunters' lives. Executioner Broadheads, born to kill. Treason, don't just blend, become. And by Citadel, revolutionary shoot down shape. It had been about two weeks since I had that really close encounter with that big non-typical. I had went back and I'd hunted that setup as much as I could. I had probably hunted it three or four times over the course of over, over two or three week period, just trying to close the distance uh, on the big non-typical. And I had seen a lot of deer, everything was fine, there wasn't any issues with the hunt, it was just typical bow hunting in East Texas. Sometimes you would see a lot of deer, the next time you'd hunt the setup, you wouldn't see anything. And that's just typical hunting here in the south. And I had ranged it where I could hunt on a morning's hunt. It was a Friday morning, I got there early, got everything set up. As soon as daylight got there, I started seeing deer. And it wasn't long that a buck came out that I hadn't seen before. Take a look at this deer. He's just a frame eight point, super tall brows. He, he's a narrow spread. His mo main beams are long and they wrap in, they almost touch together. He's a really cool deer. And I was loving this deer and I just totally forgot about that non-typical. If this buck comes in, uh, I'm gonna take a shot at him. What a beautiful buck. He, he got in there to about 32, 33 yards a couple times. And if you bow hunt here in the south, you know how athletic and cagey and, and wiry our southern deer are. And, and about that 26, 27 yard mark, it's, it's about the furthest that I want to take a shot at a southern deer. Because it's not that I can't hit, hit, hit the target at that far, but by the time the air gets out there, these old wiry, cagey deer, they're going to drop and duck and you're going to end up making a bad shot. And I wasn't going to risk it on such a beautiful animal. And the deer walked off and I studied him a long time through binoculars and, and he, 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 was a, he was a gorgeous buck. Every time that I've hunted this setup, I put out a product called the Stage. It's a synthetic deer scent. If you follow Closing the Distance, you've seen me use it over the past three or four years. It's just a synthetic scent that calms the deer. It's a scent that smells like a deer. It's not a rut scent. It's not a doe and heat scent or anything like that. And it's a perfect scent to use that if you hunt over a food plot or hunt over a corn feeder, or if you hunt over a decoy, when a deer comes in, they smell it and for some reason, it calms them down. And I've been using this scent on every hunt and I've been putting it on the side of the feeder, on the side of the, of the tree line on this setup to where I wanted a deer to come. If a deer comes out on this, this side of the block of timber that I knew that they would smell it and they would be calmer coming into the feeder. 
but most of the deer were always coming out on the opposite side. I was seeing, I'm seeing all the deer on, on the west side of this field. Seldom did I ever have a deer come out, but I kept throwing that scent on that side because uh, that's where my shot was. I, I didn't want the scent on the other side. I want them to be calm on, on, on that right side of the feeder. And I'm sitting in the stand. It's already kind of mid-morning and I was seeing deer and I was filming some deer on the edge of this field. And to be honest with you, I was texting my daughter. My daughter was texting back and forth. I mean, just live, everything was fine. Just, just a dad talking to his daughter. And I was pretty calm. And I was looking at a deer on the edge of the field and, and responding to her text messages. And next thing I know, I look up and there's the big non-typical. I moved the camera around just as fast as I could, got everything framed in, got everything squ squared in, and that buck was standing right next to that stage scent. And he was really calm, and this is the first time that he ever came out on that side of the feeder, and he was just standing there. And he wasn't eating corn, and then I was hoping that would, he would start eating some corn, and, and my heart was racing. And, and where my camera arm is, I can't, I can't see the whole deer, but where I'm sitting, I can see the deer almost back to his hindquarters. And I, look, I was looking at the, the camera and I was making sure that I could see the arrow flight. And I said, what's wrong with taking a shot right here? He's only at about 25 yards. That, that, that's a perfect shot for me. And I took my time. I drew my bow back. I made a great shot on this huge non-typical. What a morning, what a morning. He's just right here behind this, behind this pine. He is such a unique, he's a unique deer. You won't believe what he looks like. Isn't this just a very unique? East Texas deer for sure. He's got some weird, that whole weird freaky stuff going on. Big body deer, he's, could be just a big four year old. But just look at the, 
this right here, he had to mess this up when he was fixing to split his, his G1 in velvet. I thought when we first started getting pictures of him that he had pedicle damage, but it's not. He, he messed up that G4 right there, growing velvet, and it had turned down. It's amazing that it didn't break. He's got a point right there broke off. <laughs> Very odd. And the deer like this, that's, uh, that's not a genetic issue. That's just strictly antler damage, antler damage. And this right here, I don't know if this, if this is genetics, probably just another, just this cause that to, to have a drop time. You seldom see drop time deer in East Texas, seldom if ever. And you seldom see this antler damage in East Texas. It just uh, doesn't hardly ever happen. Antler infections occasionally happen just all the all right through the country but I've never I've never aired a deer that looks so weird very unique let's count his points right fast he's got two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty just twenty one <laughs> twenty one points I don't know how you'd score him not much of a main beam, not much of an inside spread. Cool deer. After the break, hunting tips on calming down before the shot. Stay around for this. We'll be right back. Closing the distance is made possible by tree limb quivers. There's only one tree limb quiver, sword sights, Sharp solutions in aiming. Elusive wildlife technologies, taking the elusive out of wildlife. The stage deer attractant. Finally, a synthetic scent that works. Matthews Archery. And by the amazing Luminot. Can your arrow knock do this? Today's episode is titled Love the Bubble and I want to give you some tips and information on exactly what that means and, and some information on how it would help you be consistent when you're in the field. Everybody knows that if you bow hunt that every site manufacturer out there, they'll have a level, a bubble level on, on their bow side and it's something that's not new. It's been in the industry for 20 plus years and to be honest with you, I never paid attention to the bubble. Most of all my shots are 15 or 20 yards. I never even looked at the bubble. And a couple years ago, I had one of my staff guys ask me, do you look at the bubble? And I said, I never do. And he said he started doing it and his group started getting a little bit better. And so I started doing it. And what had happened, what I had learned by looking at that bubble to make sure everything was level, it wasn't to the part to where my bow was at a level. It just gave me something mental, a mental check to do right before I pulled the trigger. And when you hunt, especially when you're after a target deer like this big non-typical, our emotions can get the best of us. Uh, you may have an encounter with a big deer, and when you have a deer that comes inside your perimeter, our emotions get the best of us, and those emotions tell us to hurry up and take the shot because we think the deer is getting away. And to have something that you go to, like a bubble, something that you look at right before you pull the trigger, what it does it calms you down. What it does, it gives you confidence that everything is going to be okay because that's the way you practice. Right now when I practice, right before I take the shot, I look at the bubble. For the past several years, every, every time right before I took a shot at an animal, I look at my bubble, it gives me confidence. If that's not level, if everything's not perfect, I don't take the shot. In my shot situation, my shot sequences, uh, the success rate has went higher because I love the bubble. The point is, no matter what you do, pick something. Pick the level on your bow. Pick something that you go to that final second before you pull the trigger, and I guarantee you, it'll help you. Let's check in with Brother Mark. On today's show, Matt's given us some really, really, really good tips so we prepare properly as we approach that all-important moment of truth. Because once we touch that arrow off, uh, we can't reach out and get it again. It's, it's already done. So what we do to prepare for that is so important. And I really appreciate the tips that Matt gave us today. But it really got me thinking about um, life. Because uh, in life, 
we have to prepare to make decisions, right? And there are some decisions that we make in life that are really small and kind of inconsequential, just everyday decisions that aren't really that big of a deal. But then you and I both know that there's some decisions that we make in life that are really big, that have long-term effects, that have really long-term consequences. And what we do to prepare to make those decisions and pull the trigger on those decisions can really make all the difference in the world. And the question that I have is where do we go when we need to make those kind of decisions? Where do we find the wisdom that we need to make really good decisions? Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in James chapter 1 that if we lack wisdom or the ability to really know what to do, that we can ask God for it and God loves us so much that He would give us the wisdom that we need to make the best decisions in life possible. And if you're struggling with a decision right now and don't know which way to go or which way to turn, here's what I would encourage you to do. Reach out to God. He loves you, He cares for you, and He really wants to help you make the best decisions in life and I promise you that He will. If you'd like to know more about a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, just go to ClosingTheDistance.com and click on the Moment of Truth tab. Want more from Closing the Distance? Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram.